The deer you shot on public land ran onto private property and then died. You shot and killed what you thought was a spike elk, only to discover that it was actually a cow elk. You just finished filleting the six rainbow trout you caught before realizing that the catch limit at the reservoir was actually four trout. These are some of the wildlife violations that conservation officers around Utah encounter, and here are some things you should know to ensure you don't break the law. This is Wild, a Utah Division of Wildlife Resources podcast. I'm your host, Faith Heaton Jolly, and this is episode 23, Enforcing Wildlife Laws. Welcome back to Wild. This is our 23rd episode, and today we are here in studio, not somewhere fun and exciting out in the field like we have been for some of these episodes. So today I'm here with Captain Wyatt Bubach. He is obviously our law enforcement captain here for the Division of Wildlife. Thanks for joining me on this yep, podcast my today. My pleasure, for sure. Tell us a little bit about how long you've been with the division and kind of what it is that you do for DWR. Sure. I've been with the division for 11 years and in my current position as captain, I'm over statewide operations. So anything that the field needs, when I say field, the law enforcement officers that are out there enforcing the, the state laws, I kind of help guide them on what our emphasis should be for hunting seasons or throughout the year and, and help them with equipment and just day-to-day operations. So I basically oversee all the day-to-day operations in the enforcement section here. So you're you're the boss, basically. I, 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 I don't like being called boss for sure. You're but, a big uh, deal. He's yeah. a big deal, basically. <laughs> do you do a lot of like training type stuff? Yeah, so we have a training lieutenant and I work hand in hand with him to make sure our guys are getting what they need. And then I kind of help monitor all that, make sure our guys are all up to speed and uh, have the hours that they need for training. Basically, if we need enforcement efforts somewhere in the state or, or whatever, I'm in charge of coordinating all that stuff. Gotcha. Making sure all of the different areas yep. kind of are fully staffed. Yep, and, exactly. Okay. Yep. So talk to us a little bit about what kind of the primary duties of a conservation officer are, because I I know there's like some misconceptions and there's a lot of nicknames, you know, (laughs) game wardens. There's plenty. Anyway. Yeah. So basically our our day-to-day goal is to help protect the resources in the wildlife that need those resources, habitat, water, uh, things like that. So the main point of our day-to-day stuff is we talk to hunters, talk to fishermen, talk to trappers, make sure they're obeying the laws and regulations that are in place and just interact with the public. I mean, a lot of people, including me when I was younger, I'd interact with game wardens and I'd always get nervous when they'd come up and talk to me and and like I was doing something wrong when I wasn't. And I think sure. a lot of well, people... Well, it's the same like when you're driving down sure. the highway and you <laughs> yeah. see a cop, yeah. you're like, am I speeding? Yeah. Am I wearing my seatbelt? <laughs> like you kind of panic yeah. a little. Yeah. So we talk to tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people a year. And, uh, you know, 97% of those people are doing everything right. And uh, we, we just enjoy talking to the hunting, fishing, trapping public and the non-consumptive users as well. So if you see us out in the field, don't stress anything we just come make sure everything's going well and then and then we'll carry on with our day or answer any questions you have but our day-to-day goal is to protect the resources and we do that through the enforcement of laws kind of going into that like talk about what does kind of a normal day look like for one of our officers mm-hmm. like that are out in the field i feel like you kind of do more of the administrative sure. type yep. stuff mm-hmm. which i'm like bless you because that's <laughs> rough but yeah like one of our officers that's like out patrolling like kind of what does a normal day look yep. like it's hugely diverse for our guys and gals for that matter we ha- we've hired a number of females the past couple of years we're super excited to have them on they're doing a phenomenal job but and they're uh, legit they're good they are very high performing individuals to kind of explain a little bit about what we do to get into what we do day to day the enforcement stuff we do, we'll do public safety stuff. If we see a guy that we think is driving drunk or whatever, we, we deal with those things as well. We do biology work with the biologists um, when they need our help. We do a lot of outreach events like um, shop with a cop or cops and bobbers, or we put together hunts for terminally ill people, both kids and adults. And so we're involved in, in a lot of different things outside of just field enforcement. Um, it goes on to nuisance work, working with cities and things to help alleviate you know moose in town or or things of that nature so i feel like you guys do a lot of that yeah, too. especially in uh like the the wasatch and and utah county areas it's 
I don't know if this year is any different than the past, but we, we, they stay really busy with those big game animals, even snakes or owls in houses. I mean, they stay really busy with that type of work. And you guys are often like the first call because it happens a lot of times after hours yep. so they can't like go through the normal call the office and dispatch <laughs> right. biologists yeah, yeah. I've, I've got some good stories about late night phone calls for those types of things but yeah so day-to-day stuff largely depends on where you're at as far as where you're where you're stationed in the state for example our bullfrog officer cheyenne hudson a female that we hired about a year and a half ago doing great um her district's pretty slow during the summer she has lake Powell. she's got a lot of ais stuff um but she has essentially one fishery in her district of Lake Powell, where a Davis County officer has a third of the urban fisheries in the entire state in his area or her area. And so we have waterfowl areas, we have big game areas, and a lot of nuisance. So a normal day would be us going out, talking to hunter, fisher, trappers, um, non-consumptive users, just checking licenses and making sure every, everybody's in compliance. Where do they decide like where to patrol that day? Do they kind of just rotate where they're going to go in yeah. a given day or week? Yeah, it's based largely on what's going on. Uh, if you have the big game hunts, then they're typically up on the mountains. If you have waterfowl going on, then they'll be out in the swamps. But those overlap frequently and throughout most of the fall. So our officers more or less get to pick and choose what they do day to day. That um, makes sense. They, they choose if they want, need to go work early in the morning based on maybe they're getting some calls of early shooting on waterfowl, or maybe they work super late at night because they have spotlighting issues in their area. And so they have a lot of flexibility. We, we trust them to do their job well and provide them that flexibility to be efficient and effective in, a, in their role. You may start out your day thinking, I'm just going to patrol fishermen all day, and you may get called on a nuisance call or you may have a a big game case pop up and you need to spend the next day or three weeks working a single case and so you watch a lot of those shows on tv and similar here they just do a a wide variety of work every day and and you never really know what your day is going to entail and that's what makes this job for me at least when i was in the field so great it's fun you never knew what you're going to get into geese walking down the freeway and you're trying to (laughs) hurt them hurt them and get them piled up and and so it, it's it's a fun fun job. It's really diverse and unexpected most that of the time. That is cool. Yeah. Keeps yeah. you keeps you on your toes. It does. Yeah. Yep, yep. No, that's cool. Just to kind of paint a picture for people, how many officers do we have across the state? Yep. So we have actual titled officers that have an assigned district. We have roughly fifty, and that equals and that's a, for the whole the state. whole state. It okay. averages about two thousand square miles per officer. Wow. Um, we have more officers in the urban areas just because they, they get a higher volume of call, um, a lot more nuisance and things of that nature, a lot more eyeballs that, that are out there from the public to help us report and, and identify crimes. So we typically staff those areas with more officers where low populated areas, you know, those officers cover obviously well more than, than 2,000 square miles per guy. I mean, there's there's officers that can drive two or three hours and not get across their district. Oh, wow. Yeah, That's so crazy. We are certainly spread thin, um, and we, we love the public for their help, and they help us a ton throughout the years. So. And I'm glad you plugged that, because I feel like that's something that we're always trying to plug is, you know, we can't be everywhere. Yeah. We don't have people that can be in every spot <laughs> right. and not every moment. So it is very important for people to call yeah, if they see sure. something weird or anyway, to help report those wildlife violations. You've kind of talked about what our officers do, kind of what some of those jobs look like. What are some of the common misconceptions that people have about conservation officers? I I think the biggest one, and we hear this every once in a while and probably annually from people when we interact with them that that we're trying to address a, a certain situation, is that they think we're limited to wildlife law or that we can't work down in the cities or things of that nature. So we may pull someone over for speeding or reckless driving, or we may go help a deputy on a domestic violence call or something because we're the closest officer there. And and a lot of our rural guys do deal with those things on a regular basis because there's only one or two other law enforcement officers on in the whole county where there's several hundred in, you know, Davis and Utah and Salt Lake County. We have public that will say, well, you can't pull me over. You can't write me that ticket. And You're you're just a fish (laughs) cop. Right, exactly. You you can't do anything that sides wildlife stuff. And, And that's not true. We we're certified just like any other law enforcement officer in the state. We can enforce any law in the state just like any other law enforcement officer. Um, it's no different. A, a, a city cop or a county sheriff or deputy can enforce wildlife crimes if, if they so choose. But uh, that's probably one of the more common misconceptions that we see out there is they, they think we're, we're bound to wildlife law or that we don't 
deal with traditional enforcement issues, which increasingly, especially this year with COVID and and the amount of people that were recreating, not tied to hunting or fishing that we we interacted with and had to work on challenges with, uh, we do it regularly. And it's increasing every year with how much we deal with that type of stuff. Interesting. Um, And I was going to say, I know, so we have several canine officers. We did a previous episode kind of just specific to our canine officers. Um, And I know that our guys have helped with quite a few like search and rescue yeah. type things too with their yeah dogs. They're, they're getting called more and more frequently we had a, a sheriff recently that called upon us for some help and he says i will not use another agency besides the division of wildlife for tracking and and trying to locate personal items to better identify in search and rescue e- efforts where these individuals may be oh wow um, so we're getting some recognition um obviously i'm biased but i think we have some of the best tracking and detection dogs as far as um, article detections like clothes and cell phones and things like that that are in the state. Um, I know. Look at you guys. Yeah, you're, you're doing you're, well. You're in high demand. We're doing well. They're like, no, no, we need a, <laughs> we need a DWR <laughs> yeah. dog on this one. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, and so you can just, if you see somebody breaking any other types of laws, speeding, mm-hmm. stealing, whatever, like you could go and just yep. make those same arrests. Yep. And there's situations where a given officer may not have the training to feel completely comfortable and stuff. And so he may call for assistance and and get some help to work through it. But I mean, we did a checkpoint um, last week or the weekend before, and we had three or four DUIs that we dealt with. And and so our officers are familiar and comfortable with those things. If someone's driving reckless 110 miles an hour on a bullet bike down the freeway, we'll pull over those people. Like you've got to watch out for our DWR trucks, (laughs) just the same as as UHP. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So kind of getting into though, some of the like we've talked to some of the wildlife enforcement, things like that. Talk a little bit about how the work we do benefits fish and wildlife and kind of helps with that conservation. Sure. So we have brilliant biologists that's obviously have essentially dedicated their life to helping the, the wildlife, uh, both uh, the, the species that we hunt and that we don't hunt. We've got exceptional biologists that help put, to, put together management plans that help to ensure this, the, the health of those populations into the future. And some of those we manage with hunting and and others we don't, but nonetheless, we have plans in place to help ensure that those populations continue. And and those rules or guidance on how those species are managed are in guidebooks or administrative rule or in state law. And so these biologists work together, they put together a plan that they think will work for the species and put together guidance or rules or, or laws that help protect those. And then our our job is to go enforce those laws so that that management plan can be effective and successful. So w- without our biologists, you know, we, we're educated in biology, most of, most of our officers, and so we're knowledgeable on, on how they do some stuff. But without them putting together these great plans and us to help them enforce the laws and ensure that those plans maintain intact and are adhered to by the, the recreating public, our w- wildlife would struggle and certainly wouldn't be what it is in Utah today. So oh, totally. our main role is just to help the biologists ensure that their management plans achieve what they're looking for. You enforce it, make sure it, mm-hmm. make sure people are following it. Exactly. And I'm obviously not a biologist. I've mentioned that several times <laughs> and anyone that listens to this, yep. it's very clear that I am <laughs> not a biologist. But it's been interesting as I've worked here and gone to different conferences and just kind of as I've learned from some of our biologists and staff, it is pretty amazing that like you said, all the plans and all the research and all the data really does go into like making sure all these different species stay healthy. And when you look back, you know, 150 years ago, like some species were almost completely wiped out because they were over hunted or over trapped or whatever from early settlers. So it is kind of amazing, like, oh, this is all for a purpose. You know, this isn't just, you know, the government trying to be heavy handed or control what people do. Like, this is legit yeah. science to help maintain these populations. Yeah. And, and our biologists are, are doing groundbreaking stuff as far as like health of populations and, and how the health of a mother affects the, the long-term antler growth of, of offspring. I mean, they're doing some groundbreaking stuff in the state and they are good. I mean, they do a very, very good job. So we just do our best to help them out and, and make sure that they can continue to do what they're doing. Yeah, I love that. It takes, you know, teamwork, yeah. right? Like yeah. we're all <laughs> we're all helping the wildlife together. Yeah. So kind of going into some of the things that you guys do encounter as you're trying to enforce these laws, what would you say are some of the most common fishing violations that our officers encounter? Yeah. So without a doubt, fishing without a license is our, our most common violation. Okay. Um, we probably have uh, in 2020, I looked at this, we had a, about a 1,000 violations associated with fishing without a wild license. And that can be anywhere from 
I have a license, but I don't have it on me to, I've never had a license and I've fished for 30 years and you finally caught me. You know, there's a a wide array (laughs) of of fishing without a license. And that's not to say, you know, not everybody that's fishing without a license gets a ticket. You know, we we issue a heavy percentage of warnings for those types of things. Sure. Um, We'll look at every situation, like if you bought licenses in the past, um, if you bought license for the last 20 years, obviously it's likely you just forgot that it lapsed by two or three days or whatever it may be. So about a thousand, thousand of those a year, it seems like, which is by far our most common. Uh, the next one would be probably unlawful take associated with fish, and that can cover a wide array of things. It can be uh, um, catching a fish with bait and an artificial only, um, catching an over limit of fish, catching a slot limit fish. Catching, which, explain what that is. Oh, you know, slot limit fish. So like a strawberry reservoir, there's some biological reasons we have slot limit. So a slot limit is basically saying you can't keep a fish between 15 and 22 inches. And the reason for that is is our biologists have identified that those size or age class of fish help control other less desirable fish populations in that water. And so we want to keep as many of that age group or that size class fish in that water to help be a biological control for other fish species that, that could create problems there. And so when someone goes fishing at one of these waters like Strawberry Reservoir and catches a, a slot limit cutthroat, a cutthroat that's in between 15 and 22 inches and keeps that, um, that would be a slot limit violation. Gotcha. So that would be an example of an unlawful take of fish. And there's a, a whole plethora of different ways that, that we had define unlawful take of those fish, but we probably have three to 400 of those a year. Okay. So kind of on the flip side of that, so what would you say are the most common hunting violations that we encounter? So trespass has been a growing concern for us, and whether it's people have hunted an area for a long time and it's never been posted in Utah, the property has to be posted unless it's cultivated to keep people off. So if it's not posted, you can go hunt that property as long as it isn't cultivated. And by cultivated, you mean? Like uh, farm ground or uh, artificially irrigated cow pasture. Oh, um, I see. Those types of things. If, if if it's a cornfield or an alfalfa field, you can't go into that without permission, even if it's not posted. It's I obvious see. that it's private property, I guess, is what it's what it's saying. But there's areas across the state that people have hunted for, for decades that haven't been posted, that a new landowner comes in and, and posts it, and they're like, well, I've hunted here for 20, 30 years. I'm going to hunt it anyways, even though this sign says I can't. Oh, so, no. I mean, that's one of many examples, but trespassing's been a growing issue in Utah uh, that our officers are dealing with on a routine basis. Unlawful take of big game or waterfowl or whatever would be another one, probably our number two. Um, shooting the wrong species of ducks pretty common. It's that's a challenging sport at times. Waterfowl to identify those birds on the wing. They it's just a, accidentally shoot sure. the wrong one yep. or too many yep. of the. I thought it was gadwall and it ends up being a, an extra hen mallard or you know we can work through those things and we understand that, that that's a challenging sport and we take that into consideration. Shooting a deer out of unit, shooting before the season, um, those types of things would be another common violation for our hunting public. And then hunting without a license or failure to tag big game would probably be number three. Like they have the permit, they have whatever, but they just don't put the tag on it when they transport it. And some people don't understand why that's a concern as far as on the enforcement side of things. And and where it's a concern for us is if we contact you on the the fourth or fifth day of the season, let's say, and you have a a deer in your truck and you have a tag that you haven't notched, then we we don't know if you've done that same thing on day one and two and three and and Um. how many times you may have harvested a deer with without notching your tag we just happen to catch you and then you notch it when when we see you we understand that sometimes that's an accident too and we talk to you and, and figure out what's actually the case but failure to tag is basically you harvest an animal and before you move that animal or you leave the area you need to detach and notch out your tag as it is it will explain on the the tag itself and then it's tagged and then you're all you're good to go there but if you get that animal all the way to your vehicle and driving home and we talk to you and it's not detached and notched and we'll have some additional questions just to sort out what's going on. Gotcha. And a lot of these violations, um, like what should someone do if they accidentally do something like this and, you know, whether hunting or fishing or whatever? There's not anybody, even, even the most morally sound and ethic person that does something wrong wants to call themselves in. Um, but if you if you have an accident or you do something and then you're like, ah, I shouldn't have done that, like give us a call, talk to us. We'll afford you the luxury of kind of telling us your story and we'll make sure all the pieces match. But um, there's a good example of this that, that I had when I was in the field. We had a, a guy that was hunting elk on the, the Wasatch front there, got into a herd of elk, 
shot once, the whole herd stood up, shot again, and the herd ran off. He shot the same animal twice, so he, he's good there, no issues there. He looked for 45 minutes for blood and uh, couldn't find any blood at all. This is in the snow. Uh, the elk ran off, and he knew where they went or suspected he knew where they went. Um, ended up catching up to the herd, shot, killed one, cleaned it. As he's packing it off the mountain, he runs into a freshly killed elk, which was ultimately the first elk that he shot at. Oh, no. So he's got one tag and two elk down. Um, he sat down on the mountain, called us, says, hey, this is what's going on. Um, what do you want me to do? And we had them clean both elk, take them both down the mountain so that it didn't go to waste. Um, and we will always encourage you to do that. If something happens accidentally, take care of them so you're not facing another concern of, of letting that animal go to waste. But sure. So we went up with him the next day, walked through the whole process. He said, I shot from here. They were over here. He showed us how much he walked. And he, and he packed every square inch of like a, a 40 yard by 40 yard section of where that cow elk had been standing and couldn't find any blood. And, and the cow ultimately ran about 200 yards and died. And then in that 200 yards in the snow, we found like two eraser sized drops of blood. And uh, so he, we ended up giving him a warning like, you, it's not illegal to miss an animal and go harvest another one. And, sure. and he honestly thought he did. And he put in a, a, a lot of effort to try to locate that animal and wasn't able to. So he got a warning. Um, had he not turned himself in, there was another group of hunters on the other ridge line that saw all this, saw him shoot, saw the cow run over the hill, saw it die because they had a different angle. Oh. He went and looked, and then he, they watched him go shoot a second one. So before that other guy, the shooter, actually even knew he had a violation, the other party had called us and says, hey, this is what I just watched. This guy's parked here. This is a license plate. And uh, we have all the same abilities as far as license plates go as, as other law enforcement officers. So we knew the guy's name, knew where he lived, knew where he worked, phone number. And we knew all this stuff before the guy even committed or knew he committed an accidental violation. So had he not turned himself in, he's pay facing possible felonies and license suspensions and, and all that other stuff. So he did the right thing as hard as as hard as it would be to do. Call us and, and you know, we'll, we'll treat it how it should be treated. Sure. Give us a trust it, us a little right. bit. Yeah. And if it's a genuine accident, that is going to be different yeah. than if somebody did it on yeah. purpose. And it would have been much different had he had he tried to get away with it and knew try to cover it up right. yeah i see um and like logistically if somebody like what do you recommend if somebody so let's say he'd accidentally done that but he didn't have cell service mm -hmm. like should he just leave the animals there and drive to call yeah. like and get help yep. or you know what i mean <laughs> yeah. like what i guess what's the process of like when should you report as, it as soon as you possibly can because that will bring up less questions for us you know if you run into if you go two days and then report it um, you know, what happened in that two days that may have, did someone find out that you did that or whatever. So we understand a lot of places we hunt don't, doesn't have right. cell service and take care of the animals, make sure they do your best to make sure they don't go to waste. Um, get them out, give us a call as soon as you possibly can and, and let's have a chat and we'll, we'll work through it together. Gotcha. Yeah. And I was going to say, and I'm, I like know a lot of our officers and like all of you guys are reasonable people. <laughs> like right. like try to be. people understand yeah. that things happen, you know, and I feel like you guys usually are like try to be understanding of, sure. of situations like yeah. that. You, you hunt and you fish long enough, something's going to happen. I mean, we, we've had officers that have had accidents happen while being officers, you know, and uh, so we certainly understand that. And uh, we'll work we'll work with you and, and figure out exactly what happened and uh, and make the best take the best approach we possibly can to, to deal with the situation. Sure. I was going to say, I'm, I like grew up in a hunting, fishing family, whatever, but I myself haven't hunted a ton, <laughs> but I did go on my first, um, turkey hunt this spring, oh, just it? general season. And my brother-in-law was making fun of me. He was taking me, but I legit like read the entire <laughs> guidebook <laughs> on my drive down. Cause I was so like nervous yeah. about not doing something right or not knowing something. And I'm like, I work here. So <laughs> if like, yeah. if I did something, you know, like it's not great. Yeah. So, um, no, I totally get that kind of like being nervous and making sure yeah. you're, you know, getting everything right. Um, so let's talk about, you know, these are kind of accidental type things. What, when would somebody's hunting or a fishing license actually be suspended for doing some type of violation. Right. So we have code and, and uh, policy that kind of guide how we go about license suspensions. But basically, we, we'll reserve that for an individual who goes out and intentionally or knowingly or intentionally violates wildlife laws, basically has 
no regard for laws and just going to do what they want. Those are the individuals we're looking to address their acts with suspension. So they can't continue to do that or can't continue to obtain licenses. Like it's very sure that it's not an accident. Yeah, yeah. Like, this will not be an accident. This, this is like be, they purposely did right. this. Yep. And, and we, we go through a lot of effort to make sure we're ad- using that appropriately for the appropriate people. It's not something that, that we're willy-nilly about. Um, we take license suspensions very seriously. So um, for those for those people that go and do that knowingly and intentionally, um, that's what our license suspension is there for. Um, those people that have done something multiple times and, and we've addressed it with citations multiple times and that's not solving the problem um, or does something so so big and egregious that, that it's so out of line from the norm that that it needs to be addressed with a stern um, stern action. So uh, how that works is basically um, through whatever case investigation or interaction we have with the public, someone's either cited or charged for a violation. Uh, that will go through the court system. And if they're convicted of it, depending on what they're convicted of, um, we'll submit a request for suspension um, based on the severity of the crime that they committed. Um, after the court stuff's all dealt with, then they go through an administrative in-house kind of process. That de- it's kind of like a mini court in itself. That, I uh, I call I refer to it as wildlife court. <laughs> it's, but it's much the same. I've I haven't attended any in person because it's all been like over the phone right. during COVID. Those are the only ones I've attended. But it feels very much like a yep. like a court case you'd see on TV. But it's just wildlife related. Yep. So uh, we have a, a hearing officer that that will kind of hear the facts again, and then we'll ultimately make a decision on on if and if so, how long and what licenses are suspended for the individual. Um, so generally speaking, if if you commit a, a big enough big game violation knowingly, intentionally, and you go through the license suspension process, you know we'll recommend that your big game license gets suspended for whatever number of years based on the crime that you committed. Um, same thing with fishing. So we try to when we do license suspensions, tie it to the act in which the violation occurred. Um, but if we get we have had individuals that have done so many improper wrong things that that they get all their licenses suspended and uh that's like your entire hunting yeah, and ha- fishing hunting fishing trapping can't do anything i and, see and uh once that goes through us it goes into to what we call iwvc which is interstate wildlife violator compact um, which is basically an agreement between utah and i think like 48 other states now that say hey if if an individual gets suspended in utah for big game privileges big game hunting privileges us 48 other states will honor that suspension and so, so they you, can't hunt you, there they either. can't hunt in, but almost every state in the nation at this point you know you got canada and africa and, and central and south america stuff like that you can probably still hunt in but uh it, it isn't going to be in a state in the united states gotcha um, so it's it has some some big effects if if you choose to do that knowingly intentionally right and talk about kind of the length of the suspensions um i know it's usually more kind of like the the end of the spectrum, the longest length, if it's like a trophy right. type animal. Yep. So like a, a class B misdemeanor will be a, a recommendation of three years a, or could be up to three years. Class A is five, a felony seven. And then if the animal that you took was a trophy, in, in the case of big game, it can double that suspension. So let's say you shoot a trophy elk with illegally out of season without a license, let's say, um, an elk is, is a possible felony. That's seven years. And if it's a trophy elk, we can recommend 14. Wow. Um, if you shoot two or three, we can th- those years just continue to add up. Um, so that that's generally how we um, will recommend our suspensions. But there's mitigating, like if the guy is really cooperative after we've dealt with him, we, we can start to, you know, um, even though he did it knowingly, intentionally, we can work with him depending on how his actions are after that. So law may recommend three but we can say you know he's done everything he can after the fact maybe we'll go with one or two or something like that. gotcha and if somebody like let's say if i go like deer hunting for my first time or whatever and i accidentally you know don't follow the boundary and i shoot a deer outside of the boundary whatever and it is an accident but then i don't report it um i'm assuming that could still be like i could be liable for like some type of suspension since sure. It's, yeah, it, it's it, not intentional, but I'm also not, like, helping out the right. situation. <laughs> yeah, and, and like I said, we, we 
try not to use it anytime it's not knowing or intentional. So, you know, we may go with a, an unlawful take like we talked about earlier for that. Like you should have known, like you should have read the guidebook or, or done a little bit more research on where your boundary was. You're new, like all those things factor in, especially like the new hunters. Like we want them to have a good time. And, sure. and we understand that hunting can be complicated and fishing can be complicated for that matter. And we, we want you to have fun. We want you to continue to do it. And, and when you're new, we, we take that into consideration. It can be stressful, sure. like trying yeah. to learn all the rules, make sure you're following all the rules, because there's a lot. Yeah. yeah. yeah and I, I mean, it's no different from, I've hunted and fished my whole life. And, uh, you know, whether it's turkey, I haven't hunted much turkey in my life. And so I'm starting to hunt more turkey. And the first couple of times, it's like, I'm no different than a first time turkey hunter. Mm-hmm. Even though I work for the division, I've hunted my whole life. You know, it's a different thing that I've never done. So I'm, like you said, like reading the guidebook from yep. front to back and yep. making sure I'm not getting myself <laughs> in trouble because it, it, it would be slightly embarrassing to have that happen oh, when, when sure. you work for the division. But um, that's what we want new hunters to do. And, and I'm continually impressed with the new hunters that are doing it on their own, you know, like don't have any mentor. Like oh, those yeah. people are impressive because I've had a million mentors. And for them to say, I'm going to learn how to do this and I'm going to do it on my own. And because it is hard. Yeah, it's a, it's a hard, it's, it's not an easy sport. It's impressive. And there's a lot of rules. And yeah, like yeah. you said, things that you need to know and just kind of knowledge. Um, so kind of, you kind of touched on this, but I guess what is kind of the main message that you would want to give to hunters and anglers on like basically how to avoid violating some of these laws? Yeah, so our, our guidebooks are free. Basically our guidebooks is is kind of like a guiding document for all hunters, whether you're, whether you're new or experienced, like all the laws, all the regulations that we expect a hunter to know, all of them will be in there. You don't have to worry about necessarily researching it in code or researching an administrative rule. We have a whole team here at the division that compiles all that and puts it into a, a, a more or less simple reading document for the public. And so if you're you're new or you're experienced or whatever, it doesn't matter. We have changes continually. So every year, just scan through that guidebook. If you're new, read it in depth so you have a firm understanding. And uh, as long as you adhere to whatever's in there, uh, you'll, you'll be perfectly fine. Um, if you are unclear or uncertain of something in there or you're not familiar with verbiage, call a regional office, contact your local conservation officer, ask a question. Don't always... As, as good spirited as they may be, don't rely on your friends all the time because they may sure. not have the information as sure. well. So, if if you have a question, uh, get that answer yourself, and and I'd get it from the source, um, which is the Division of Wildlife who creates those rules. So. Sure. And that was kind of why my brother-in-law was making fun of me for our turkey hunt. He's like, "I'm not going to take you to do anything illegal," <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, "I know, but yeah. I would rather just if I do something wrong, I'd rather it be because it's my right. fault, yeah. and yeah. you know, not because I was relying on somebody else. You know, because people are people. Yeah. You know, we're mm-hmm. all human. Yeah. We make mistakes sure. or forget or whatever. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's sound advice. And I feel like just from the like hunting suspension hearings that I have been to, um, a lot of it was like they'd been hunting for a long time and they should have known better, yeah. but they just didn't do their homework mm-hmm. or they didn't double check or they didn't make absolutely sure they were in the boundary mm-hmm. or in the right season or whatever, you know, had the right permit or something. So I think that is a big thing. Like yeah. you, you wouldn't go try and fly a plane for the first time without doing all the training <laughs> and the classes right. and whatever. Yeah. Like, why would you do that hunting? Right. You know, like it's it, cause it is complicated. Yeah. Like you'd mentioned. Um, and so, yeah, like you said, I think the guidebook is a great resource. Um, and then, you know, we do have a lot of those mentor programs yeah. kind of, you'd mentioned, yeah. you know, for somebody that is trying to do it by themselves for the mm-hmm. first time, like we have kind of a, you know, trial hunting program, right. mentor programs, and I think those can be a really good resource for people too. There's been a lot of uh, NGOs uh, uh, like Mule Deer Foundation or Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Sportsman for Fish and Wildlife, that have started to develop programs for non-youth hunters. So we have a lot of people and a lot of programs set up for youth, and we're learning that there's a lot of 20 to 35 year olds that are wanting to get into sport as well. And so those, those kind of like nonprofit um, organizations, like I reference, are starting to say, hey, look, like we'll help you even if you're 30. Like we just want people to enjoy the outdoors, enjoy hunting and fishing. And uh, we, we have the programs to do that. So reaching out to, to a, a nonprofit that's associated with wildlife can can be beneficial as well because they're starting to, starting to realize the benefit of, of helping the the not-so-youth um, get into the sport as well. Totally. 
And I think that, you know, that is important because like you said, I mean, a lot of people, they didn't have a family kind of background. Mm -hmm. And and like I like I said, I even did have a family background, but I was just always too busy to, Mm -hmm. you know, I went hunting a handful of times, but never like harvested anything, never saw anything. And so I do feel like I'm kind of a noob Mm -hmm. and I'm starting at this, you know, from the ground up. And so, yeah, there are a lot of resources. And Crystal Ross is in, works for the divisions kind of in similar, you know, she's yeah. just starting to hunt and fish herself. Yeah, so. she's our social media coordinator. And yeah, I think it's awesome. And, and like you said, I think it's important that people realize like it is it is a really unique but really fun sport. Like it, it is exhilarating when you're out there and you do see wild, you know, like I didn't even technically harvest a turkey at all. Like I got a shot off at one and missed. We won't talk about <laughs> that. Um, but to even just see them and right. to hear them, like I was so excited. Like yeah. it was so cool. And so, you know, I think people should just, you know, give it a chance. You know, don't be so freaked out of right. breaking the rules that you never attempt it. But also like do your homework, yeah. you know, and be smart and make sure you're doing the right thing. So um, anyway, well, and I was going to ask just before we end, um, what would you say is your favorite part of you know, being a, a law enforcement officer for the division? For, for me, it's interacting with the public. And, and we get asked lots of questions and uh, the same questions a million times sometimes. And, and But man, it's, you work outside, you make your own schedule, you, you talk with people that have like interests. And even when you're dealing with non-consumptives, the bird watchers, um, the mountain bikers, the the guys and gals that are out there on ATVs, like we're just out there enjoying the outdoors, you know. And, and so to be able to go and do what you want every day, more or less, choose your schedule, choose where you go, it, it's great. I mean, the diversity in the work. If if you get tired of in, of talking and checking licenses, you can go work with a biologist for a day and and band geese which uh this has been that's been on the podcast if i don't recall or Mm -hmm. or go count deer or count grouse i mean it's it's an extremely diverse job that if you get bored in it it's because you're choosing to be bored in it there's so much you can do in this in this career give it five minutes and you'll get called (laughs) on something else yeah yeah Yeah, i mean rattlesnakes or or whatever i mean it it's a cool job so i i'm someone that likes to be busy um i started in davis county which is a very busy county um but the diversity the speed of life at times in this job you're going 100 miles an hour during the hunting season it's it's fun it is is genuinely a job that i've not dreaded a day of work it, oh, that's cool. there's not a lot of people that can say that in school yeah so. that's super cool um and to kind of follow up with that before we wrap up um what would you say is like one of your most memorable or maybe kind of a favorite experience that you've had like while on the job yeah, so there, there's a lot of funny ones but um we had Davis County has a lot of, especially in the spring, like when, when the hatchlings come out for waterfowl, we get a ton of calls for little oh. ducks and geese walking down or stuck in storm drains that we got to go figure out how to get them out. But probably one of the funniest, more funny ones or ones that just probably don't see every day is we had a whole flock of geese running down the middle of I-15. And so they called me for help. And so I'm trying to slow traffic down, going down I-15 and I have a like an incident management vehicle telling everybody behind us that there's geese on the road. So we get them herded off the road and they're running through the grass. I'm grabbing construction cones and just setting them on top of geese so that I can try to get <laughs> hands full. And so there's a, a mom and uh, a dad goose and, and like four or five goslings that we caught. And I didn't have a cage in my truck big enough to hold them. So I just threw them in the cab of the truck oh, and driving down the road and talking to dispatch on the radio and the mom goose is just honking like crazy i'm holding her in my lap and the baby geese are flying trying to fly out the windows and my windows are up and oh my gosh. so we get to a, a pond to turn them loose turn them loose at bountiful pond if if anybody knows where that's at and it's down in west bountiful there open the doors and they're just feather and goose poop and everything <laughs> just flying out of my truck and when i went to turn the wheel to turn into the pond the pond the mom goose bit my arm and so i get out of the truck covered in goose crap my truck's covered in goose crap and and people at the pond are like what is going on here (laughs) so what uh what kind of (laughs) yeah look at this guy thought you had a bad day (laughs) instantly went and got a couple different cages so i'm like i am not doing that again that was a mess but that's amazing (laughs) you know we've had we've had beavers walking down main street in kaysville at two in the morning i've had to deal with we've had deer fall in window wells that break windows and end up in houses and oh, so yeah those are wild yeah it's it's an interesting job to say the least oh so. man no that's so great uh well thanks for taking a minute to kind of let us peek into the 
the life of a <laughs> law enforcement <laughs> no officer and kind of explaining some more of those job duties and just the awesome work that you guys do. And as always, if you haven't yet, we'd love if you could subscribe to The Wild Podcast. We release a new episode on the third Tuesday of each month, and we hope you'll join us next month for some more wildlife stories. Mm-hmm.